Welcome to Down Home Dietitian. Today we're going to be talking a little bit about some considerations for first time gardeners and show you that you really, really can grow your own food. Hey guys, I am going to try recording outside today. This is going to be my first go at it. We do live near an airport. We have chickens squawking. There's highway noise. We're just going to try it because <laughs> we're in January in Western Washington. And if we get a day that isn't dumping rain, I want to be outside and hopefully you guys want to join me. So we're going to give it a go and see how it is. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about how to grow your own food at home and show you how really easy it is. And I debated about filming this myself because I didn't feel necessarily adequate to do so. I definitely, oh, look, we have some friends. <laughs> this is Chicky Mickey, Ursula, and Pox. <laughs> so they're gonna be just hanging out with me today. But I didn't necessarily feel adequate to teach people to garden because I definitely consider myself a toddler gardener. <laughs> I have only really successfully gardened myself for a couple of years. My parents always had a garden when I was growing up and we always grew our own food that way. And so I have experience in that sense, but it's very different when you're doing it yourself. So last year I had a 4,000 square foot garden, which is, yes, huge, <laughs> and I grew over 500 pounds of food in it. And that is with very minimal experience and knowledge gleaned from my parents and from gardening YouTube, basically. And so I think part of the reason that I decided to go ahead and make videos like this, teaching people how to grow their own food, is to kind of show them that it really is possible and without being like an expert green thumb gardener. I've only been doing this myself for a couple of years and it really is possible. You have some wins and you have some losses, but either way, it's so rewarding to grow your own food. The flavor is phenomenal. It's like nothing you'll ever get from a store and the nutrition is better too. And it's just nice to know where your food is coming from and also know that you can produce food even if you can't go get food, which I know was a little bit more of a concern this past year for a lot of people than it ever has been before. So anyway, I figured right about now is a good time to kind of start thinking about what are you going to plant? How much are you going to plant? And start thinking about getting a hold of your seeds and things like that. So I figured this year I'm just sort of going to walk you guys through the process with me of planting a garden, ordering seeds, uh, or getting a hold of seeds at the store, and just kind of talk you through the process I use and some really good resources that I've found and hopefully encourage some of you guys to get out in the garden and just really enjoy the process of growing your own food as much as I have. So the first question is, what are you gonna grow? And that seems possibly like a simple answer and something that seems like it shouldn't have to be said, but I've done it myself and I know other people have too, is grow things that you actually want to eat. <laughs> that seems really obvious, but sometimes when you get bit by the gardening bug or you're standing at the seed display and you just see all the packages, it's so tempting just to kind of buy like one of everything and even things you've never eaten before. And I think there's definitely a place for that, for sure. But especially if it's your first try, keep in mind that if you get this thing to grow, it's gonna produce you quite a bit of that food. So make sure that it's something that your family will actually eat in the quantities that your plants will produce. Otherwise you're gonna end up with a giant pile of produce that you have no idea what to do with and you might end up having it just go to waste, which is really a shame. So think about the things that you and your family actually like to eat. If that's greens, if that's green beans, if that's peas, if it's carrots, radishes, turnips, beets, corn, squash, you name it. 
think about the things that you your family actually eats the things that you buy from the store it's so rewarding to grow those things and then be able to first of all not have to buy them at the store but second of all just know that you grew them and now you're feeding your family the next thing to consider when you're deciding what you're going to grow is what kind of space do you have and where are you going to grow your food you can grow food in the ground you can grow food in containers you can grow food in buckets you can grow food in bags of soil in fact jess from roots and refuge farm actually has a whole video about growing greens in a bag of soil and i will link her video down below for you guys to go check out but you can grow food in all kinds of places with all levels of space uh, if you have a really small little yard if you have a front porch if you have a nice window inside that gets some good sun you can grow food you can grow herbs you can grow green onions you can grow all kinds of things so don't feel like your space is a factor in whether or not you can grow food it will affect how much you can grow possibly what kinds of things you can grow but it certainly won't keep you from growing your own food so when you're thinking about how much space you have, that's going to determine what kinds of things you can grow to the extent that certain plants like squash, pumpkins, sweet potatoes, they sprawl out and they take a ton of space. So those things are typically grown in the ground and will require a several foot block around them to, to give them space to grow properly. Other things like greens, microgreens, spinach, broccoli, carrots, those things don't require quite as much space. And there are some things that are sort of in the middle, root vegetables like potatoes, they're gonna require a couple foot square per plant just to give it space to really spread out. And some of those things like tomatoes or um, if you do pole beans or pole peas, they're gonna need some kind of support. They're gonna either need poles that you can kind of help them climb, or you're gonna need to help support the plant itself with a tomato cage or something like that. So keep those factors in mind. Other things that just grow in the ground, like root vegetables, turnips, beets, rutabagas, radishes, uh, or potatoes, don't need any kind of support. The next question is, how much are you gonna grow of each thing? And that's gonna depend, again, largely on your space, but also it's gonna depend on how much you can manage maintenance on. And maintenance varies a lot depending on the type of garden that you have. If you're growing in containers, for example, you're gonna have a lot less to worry about in regards to weeds, but you're also gonna to have to be really on top of your watering. And this is something I learned about myself about three or four years ago, I tried a container garden and I just could not manage to keep up with the watering. Containers of soil dry out much quicker than larger beds, raised beds, or in ground gardens. So it's much easier to dehydrate your plants that way. So you'll either wanna consider getting some kind of automatic watering system, or just make sure that you've set an alarm and you're really diligent about getting out there to water your pots so they don't dry out. If you have an in-ground garden, you're gonna be dealing with a lot more in the way of weeds. And the more space that you have in ground, just the more space there is for weed seeds to come in and kind of crowd out your plants. So the larger your in-ground garden, just be ready. You're gonna be dealing with more weeds unless you're ready to invest in something like weed cloth or landscaping cloth that you can cover the ground with and then you can cut or burn holes in there and plant your plants that you wanna keep in the ground and that will help prevent weed growth. But it is a little bit more of a cash investment. So these are all things just to consider. If you're a first time gardener, I think the easiest way, especially if you don't know if you're gonna like gardening or you wanna stick with it, the easiest thing is just to choose a small amount of space in whatever format you have and just make sure that it's really manageable that you can stay on top of it because otherwise you can feel really overwhelmed with gardening. Two years ago, we started with this 4,000 square foot garden and I was very overwhelmed with taking care of the weeds in that garden. I was not prepared for the amount of time it was gonna take. And this last year, we stayed on top of it a lot better. I had a little bit better of a weeding routine. It still was quite 
an effort and by the end of the season I was gradually losing the battle against the weeds but fortunately I had staved them off long enough that my plants had a chance to get really established and still produced quite a bit of food. This year we're ready to go ahead and invest in some of that landscaping cloth or fabric and uh, I'm excited about the difference that's going to make I hope in the amount of time I spend weeding. <laughs> Raised beds are going to be sort of a mix between a container garden and an in-ground garden as far as weeding and watering. They'll need less water than a container garden or less frequent watering I should say than a container garden but they're going to need a little bit more weeding than a container garden. At the same time they'll need less weeding than an in-ground garden but they'll probably need a little more water than an in-ground garden. So you can kind of decide what sort of attention you think you'll be able to pay to your garden and what is the best fit for you. So you have a list of what you're gonna grow, you have an idea of how or where you're gonna grow it. The next thing is, where do you get your seeds? How do you start or do you go from seeds or from starts? So buying seeds can be really exciting when you're first getting started, but it can also be super overwhelming depending on where you go and how you go about it. If you're a first time gardener, sometimes the simplest thing to do is to go to your local store that has a garden center and just take a look at the seeds that they have. There's a couple of really common brands, Ed Hume and Burpee. You'll see them all over the place and they have a wide variety of seeds. They'll have some options that are organic, they'll have options that aren't, and they'll be sort of a good spread of the basic vegetables that most people are familiar with and have seen before in the colors and varieties that are really kind of tried and true and seem to work the best for a lot of people as far as ease of growing and things like that. So that is probably the simplest way. Just go to the store and pick out the ones that fit your needs and fit your preferences. There are, however, so many options for purchasing seeds from local seed suppliers that grow all kinds of amazing and beautiful varieties of produce and flowers just for the purpose of sharing seeds with you. And you can find these by ordering a seed catalog. Uh, some, I have a couple of couple here. I couldn't find my third one. So uh, like Baker Creek, they're really well known for heirloom seeds, which are varieties that might be really unique but they're very tried and true heirlooms have been passed down from generation to generation you can find some really fun and unique options in here that you will certainly not find at your local big box store another great one i've got is the seed savers exchange the seed savers exchange was established in 1975 and they created a space for gardeners to save seeds from their own plants and varieties and share them amongst one another and this can be another really great place to find some really unique and um, just some heirlooms with some really cool stories a company that's local to my area in the pacific northwest is territorial they are down in oregon state and they grow a lot of things that I know will work in my climate. And that's the benefit of finding seed suppliers in your area because they're growing their plants for the seeds right where you're growing them or not too far away. So you can bet that you'll probably have a better shot at getting those things to grow in your climate since they're already from that climate. One consideration when you're buying your seeds is whether you're going to purchase hybrid or heirloom varieties. What that means is Heirloom varieties are varieties of seeds that have been passed down from generation to generation. Oftentimes they have quite a story behind them, which is a really fun, uh, which is a really fun aspect of heirloom seeds. And you can find fruits and vegetables that you've seen before, but not in the colors you've seen before. You can find them in a kaleidoscope of options, and that can be really fun. Now, hybrid seeds or hybrid varieties just means that one variety may have been crossed with another variety, sometimes on purpose, sometimes not. And that doesn't necessarily mean that they've been genetically modified, though some are. Uh, some of them have just been bred selectively for certain characteristics. And 
you can find a lot of consistency in hybrids and sometimes they're bred for certain characteristics like um, like better production or pest resistance or weed resistance so sometimes those will be a little bit easier to grow on those fronts i think hybrids and heirlooms both have their own pros and cons i grow a mix of each you can pick whatever makes sense for you so when you're looking through seed catalogs or when you're at the store and you're trying to decide what to buy you're going to have some options for how to purchase your plants so you can purchase seeds these are some of the seeds that I ordered this year from Territorial. And they come in little packets. And the packets, as well as in the seed catalogs, will have descriptions about when to sow them, how deep to sow them, how far apart to sow them, and such things that are really useful as far as knowing how to garden this particular plant. You'll also see things that are called sets. And you'll find this with like onions and garlic especially. Now a garlic set looks very much like a garlic that you would purchase at the store. In fact, it basically is. And this is where you're gonna plant the actual, an actual clove of garlic, an actual piece of the bulb. It's just a little bit farther along than the seed stage. And these are sometimes easier to work with and they grow a little bit faster than growing something from seed. The same goes for onions or potatoes where you'll actually get a little potato that you cut up into pieces and bury them like that and then you get a potato plant. The next level is when it gets closer on into spring, you'll be able to buy plant starts. So this is actually a little pot with a little plant that's already started growing. So someone else has started that plant from seed or from a set and you're purchasing a slightly grown up plant. You're gonna spend more for that plant Whereas you might spend three or four dollars for a packet of seeds that have maybe 20 seeds in them. So the capacity to be 20 plants, you might pay three or four dollars for a plant start, which is of course only one, but somebody else has already gotten it to go. If you are concerned about being able to start seeds yourself, or this is a great backup plan. If you started seeds and they didn't work out like you'd hoped, you can always go pick up a start and still have a productive garden that year. So it's up to you what you think makes the most sense for you. Growing plants from seeds is gonna require that you have a little bit of space in warm sunshine to grow your plants. So the last thing to consider is what is the growing season in your area? So for a lot of plants, they are what is called frost tender, which means they are not going to survive when it's cold enough to have frost on the ground in your area. So you can find out what your frost tender growing season is just by googling your town or your area and saying first frost date and last frost date for your area in Google. And you'll find like for example, I live in Olympia, Washington and my last frost is May 4th and my first frost is October 6th. So that gives me a growing season of approximately 155 days. You can find that out by putting distance between May 4th and October 6th into Google and it will tell you also so you don't have to counter calculate. <laughs> so once you have a good idea of how long your frost tender growing season is, you can use that as you're looking at seeds or sets or plants to buy. They will say on them what their growing season is. They'll tell you days to germination, which is how long you can expect from the time that you put a seed into the soil to the time that you'll see a little bit of green plant showing up. They'll also tell you days to maturation which will give you the amount of time that it takes from when you put the seed into the ground to when that plant is ready to bear you some fruit or vegetable that you can actually eat. So when you look at how long that's gonna take, see if you have that amount of time in your frost tender growing season to grow your frost tender plants. Now some plants are actually frost hardy, which means that they can grow even when there's frost on the ground or when it gets very cold in your area. And usually you can tell when you're looking at seeds in a seed catalog or on a packet 
it will tell you if it's frost tender or frost hardy. They'll often do that with a little symbol. So I know in the territorial catalog, they have a little snowflake next to the frost hardy plants. So you know which ones you can grow outside of that frost tender growing season. Because of some of the things that went on last year, a lot of people are getting into gardening this year. So I have heard that there's some expectation that there might be some seed shortages or it might be harder to get a hold of seeds this year than there has in past years. So I encourage you, if you're thinking about gardening this year, go ahead, decide what you're gonna plant and look into ordering some seeds. If you don't end up finding them available through catalogs, I know a lot of these seed suppliers are out for the year or are running out soon. So if you aren't able to find them, don't lose heart. There will probably be a lot of them coming out in the next few months as the bigger box stores do put out their seed displays. There should be quite a few more coming in. So if you can't find them from some of these catalogs, don't lose heart, keep looking, You'll probably find some later on. So I really hope that you, if you've thought about gardening or if you kind of want to try it but you aren't sure, just come along with me this year. I'm gonna walk you through the process that I use. Like I said, I am no professional gardener, but I did grow quite a bit of food last year. I'm hoping to improve and change and learn this year. There's always more to learn. Some of my favorite gardening YouTubers that I have learned so much from are Jess from Roots and Refuge Farm and Shay Elliott from the Elliott Homestead, who also lives here in Washington State and gardens here. I encourage you to follow them or to go find other gardening YouTubers that you enjoy, particularly if they're in your area, because that's really helpful to have somebody who's growing in your own climate to learn from, because it makes a big difference. Comment below if you have any questions about gardening, things that make you nervous about gardening, or any videos you specifically wanna see this year about growing your own food and preserving it. Thanks for joining me today, guys. I hope you got inspired to grow some of your own food this year. And remember, healthy doesn't have to be hard. This plane is circling doing some flight practice I think but he may come around again <laughs>